From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandot, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties and our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. This season of Big Ideas focuses on sustainability and sustainable practices. This episode examines the way in which children's literature can engage youth to develop a commitment to environmental and social responsibility. I'm very pleased to be joined by Carol Lindstrom and Joe Prince. Carol is an Anishinaabe Métis, author of children's books, including Girls Dance, Boys Fiddle, and the forthcoming Gift of the Great Buffalo. Her book, We Are Water Protectors, illustrated by her collaborator, Michaela Goad, was on the New York Times bestseller list and NPR's list of best books of 2020, and it won the Caldecott Medal, the highest honor in children's literature illustration. Joe Prince is a curriculum and outreach educator for the University Library's Curriculum Resource Center here at BGSU. He is the recipient of the 2022 Louise Seaman Bechtel Fellowship for Children's Literature Research from the American Library Association, and he's recently finished serving on the 2022 Siebert Award Committee for the ALA. He is also a former co-chair of the library's service to underserved children and their caregivers through the American Library Association. Thank you both so much for joining me today. You both built careers around children's literature. Carol, you as a writer, and Joe as an academic and children's uh, resource librarian. I'd like you to talk, how how did you get into this? How did you become a children's illustrator? And what role did kind of storytelling play in your experience? That's a good question. Um, I have... I've loved books since I was little. I was always at the library, like constantly. And I just felt someday I would I knew I wanted to be an author. I just thought it would be for adults. I didn't think I would write for children because when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have all the different genres of picture books and middle grade novels and YA and everything. We just it was, you know, pretty boring and then you went to adults. Um so I didn't really think about that and I just know I loved words. I loved the library. I loved books. And um, I thought, you know, I would want to write one day. But um, then when I had my son, who was now 15, I read from him, you know, to him immediately out of the womb, pretty much. And I just knew that after reading the stories to him, I thought this is really where my heart is, is, is in children's books. I like the simplicity of telling a story. But even though you have a large, maybe, comp, you know, big thing, like water protectors kind of is, but you being able to take that and um, just make it available to young people, make it so that they can just understand it. I That is, I love that. It's a challenge to writing, and that's where I kind of gravitate towards is stories that deal with environmental, social justice, and then how can I make that accessible to young people? What about for you, Joe? How did you get interested in, you know, combining both the sort of library science side with um, children's literature in particular? My response isn't going to be that much different than Karen's, actually. (laughs) Uh, I was, I've always been a voracious reader. I loved reading growing up, and I wanted to be a writer desperately. And when I went to university, I decided instead of pursuing writing, I would pursue being a teacher. And so I I became an English teacher. I taught seventh grade English. Then I taught seventh grade reading. And then I went and got my library degree and became a middle school librarian. So I have been enmeshed in the children's literature world since I graduated college. And it stuck with me to the point that I rarely even read books written for Mm -hmm. grownups anymore. It's picture books, middle (laughs) grade books, and young adult books almost Mm -hmm. exclusively. And yeah, I have just tapped into I I recognized and tapped into the power that children's literature 
has. And I think that it is, to me, far more important than that which is written for an older audience. Mm. We know that children's literature has a fraught history of failing to represent to feature diverse representation. For instance, a 2019 data from the Cooperative Children's Book Center shows that the percentages of children's books depicting main characters from diverse backgrounds are lower than the number of books with main characters who are animals. Um, So right, we're more likely to have Winnie the Pooh than we are to feature BIPOC characters. We also know that only 3.4% of books have a main character with a disability, and similar numbers have a main character who identifies as LGBTQIA. What barriers have you personally observed or experienced that have hindered the ability to feature more representation for readers to see themselves or other experiences in books? Carol, how have, how have you experienced this as a writer? And as a mom, I guess. Yeah, gosh. Um, Well, when I first started to write, seriously, it was like 2008 um, when my son was born, you know. So at that time, I I would go to conferences, you know, uh, where the writers were, the editors and publishers and so forth. And they, I was told many times when they saw my stories, well, these are just not for the trade. If they were indigenous characters, you know, um, the trade just isn't interested. You know, it's, these are just too niche. And so I remember thinking, but I don't want to write anything else. But I thought, but I, I want to be an author. So what does that mean? I want to write. So I just said, well, I'll just start writing books about tooth fairies and, you know, things that were my heart wasn't in it, but I just wanted to write. And I thought, well, maybe once I get in, I can, you know, finagle it so that, oh, here's an indigenous uh, manuscript. And that, but when We Need, we Need Diverse Books came about in 2013, I think that really opened up the the world's sort of eyes, publishers, to We Need Diverse Books. You know, like you're saying, there's, I think, less than 1% of the books are about indigenous peoples or written by them even. So, you know, there's so much work to be done in getting accurate representation and stories out. So, yeah, it, it, it's very, even now, I think it's getting, it's certainly getting better than it was. But it's shocking to me today even that it's so hard to to fight this battle that we still have less than one percent indigenous and even you know all people of color and like you're saying lgbtq plus you know it's just books should be windows and mirrors right so you children should see themselves but they should see others that aren't like them so that they can know that this world is a bigger place and it's not just made up of one homogenous group that we're all connected but we're all different Joe, from your experience as a teacher and now as a librarian, you know, how do you think about um, the issue of representation and the challenges to having books that serve as more of windows and mirrors? Well, to Carol's point, I I don't think that there's like a lack of uh, writers out there who are writing about their experiences from marginalized populations. I, I, I don't think there's some kind of dearth. I think that there are gatekeepers that gatekeepers existed within the publishing industry for so long. And, you know, in the publishing industry, if, you know, a vast majority of people who are in that industry are white or heterosexual or cisgender, they are going to purchase and lobby for the books that paint the world that they navigate through. And so they leave out people who are queer, they leave out indigenous people, they leave out Pacific Islanders and what I think, to Carol's point, happened is that we need diverse books really shined a light on this problem. Um, <laughs> it is by no means a problem that has been solved. I think we're inching closer and closer. And I think also that publishers realize that there are there's buying power in marginalized communities. You know, like as a gay man, I, in my younger days, I would have loved to have read books about queer characters in 1992, I would have felt way less alone. Um, so the need has always been there. I don't think that we had people in the publishing industry looking out for the best interests of others. I agree 100% with that. Yep, 100%. With We Are Water Protectors, we have the story of an, a young indigenous girl as she joins the fight for the protection of land rights related to the Dakota Access Pipeline, which began for real in 2016 with the efforts of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. How did you decide to get involved with to represent that particular topic um, in a children's book? 
You know, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think because, well, when it first, when I, the camp itself was set up in April of 2016, and I didn't hear about it till like maybe June of 2016, so a couple months after. And when I heard about it and saw it, it was only in social media, you know. It was only on like, you know, like Democracy Now! or some of these other sort of not mainstream, you know. And I was like, why... <laughs> why is not uh, the world knowing about this is not just a native issue this is not just an indigenous issue this is a everybody issue we all drink water we all are from water we need water to live it's everything so I felt like uh, well I wanted to go to Standing Rock but I couldn't it was just too far and and my tribe is actually Turtle Mountain Ojibwe so my tribe is in North Dakota as well so I think that that part of it too made me feel like I need to do something but then not being able to go and I I really wanted to bring people's attention to this so I did a lot of research I reached out to a lot of people from Standing Rock I have still have many friends from there um yeah I, I just felt like I need to help tell this story I need to so the people can understand the world can understand that it's it's really simple <laughs> it's just water people and we need to protect it so I don't know it was just pretty I, that's where I, I love to write those type of things, just the social justice, I think, as I said, the environmental things, and how can I make it so that it's easy for children to understand. That's where I love. That's my challenge, and I I love it. <laughs> and, Joe, as now as a librarian and thinking about kind of we've seen the backlash as well to the We Need Diverse Books movement. You know, now we have efforts to ban books in schools and, and, you know, certain states have made laws so that to discourage or chill the effect of talking about issues of race, racism, gender and sexual identity. How do you think about the role of books? You've mentioned your personal experience, but what role do books have as a form of activism as well as a form of social development for children? Well, first of all, I think this concerted effort to silence voices that have previously been silenced is only going to increase the volume of those voices. Um, I think, and I think that the youth are hungry for these stories. I Recently in central York, Pennsylvania, which is where I started my career as a teacher, there was a massive book banning that happened in the central York school district. And it was the student's in that high school that rose up and said, you're not going to take these books from us. And they were the ones that pretty much overturned those efforts. And I think that if this trend continues of books being challenged and removed from libraries, we're going to see more and more youth who are tired of being fed a single story, of being force-fed a curriculum that doesn't represent the world around them, And their voices are going to amplify. I think we have a lot to learn from this younger generation, to be perfectly honest. I have a question about audience, right? So you've mentioned, you know, that a little bit, Carol, but especially when you're thinking about writing for, you know, children or young adults, how do you approach, you've talked about kind of telling the story in a way that's accessible to children, but how do you think about shaping that story for particular ages? How do you approach that? When I write for, like, picture books... I know that the thing about picture books for me, like you have 500 words. And so I know that I have to be very judicious with every single word. So I'm always thinking when I'm writing, um, is this something I have to say or is this something the illustrator can convey with their illustrations? Because if it is, then why am I bothering? Because the illustrator needs a job too. (laughs) And if you take it all away by doing everything like saying, well, she has brown hair and black eyes or whatever, you know, then what's the illustrator to do? They, They have to, you know, as soon as they reopen it, the words, they should be able to start imagining in their brains how it's going to look I feel you know and I think for kids it's really there it's so easy in a way to write for them because it's just a matter of fairness they just believe they just you know if it's fair if it's not fair and so I feel like you know you just tell them that telling them the truth you don't have to they're a lot smarter than I think a lot of you know people give them credit for and I think it's certainly important when you write for children geez you cannot speak down to them you know they they know more than 
they know more than me, you know. So I think, you know, being very aware of the words you choose and, and not being afraid to choose big words because they know what that means. They know how they are used in a sentence. And I think that's important to always make them feeling, you know, empowered when they read the books. You hit on something that I, as a former middle school educator, I, I felt like I, I spent so much time screaming from the rooftops, like, children are not idiots. 12-year-olds are not dumb. They can process the world around them. They can think with nuance. They can extract yes. meaning. They can understand complicated arguments. When they talk about difficult issues, they might need facilitation with with navigating some of those. But by and large, they're not... They don't need to be condescended to. They don't need to be told how to think about something because they're already forming their own ideas and they're already processing the world around them. And so many adults get in their way of doing that. And that like goes back to why I think it's the youth who are going to really push back against this rising tide because they're already tired of being fed one story. Yes, exactly. They, they've heard it. How long? And they're smart. They know. <laughs> they know. Plus, I, you know, they're aware of what's going on in the world with social media. And, you know, and I, they're not, they don't want to hear this anymore. And it's really a disservice to them that we're doing as adults by not telling them, you know, tell the truth and let them understand and make the, a sense of the world. But to keep things from them well, makes no sense. On that score, like related to that is also about topic, right? That like, you know, there are folks who are concerned that like, oh, that's something to introduce later, right? I mean, clearly right now in the political environment, that is part of the discourse that, you know, things like gender identity and sexual orientation, elementary age children don't need to know about that yet. How do you respond to that when you think about kind of your approach to an issue like water conservation, environmental issues, um, indigenous rights and sovereignty? How do you think about that, Carol, as, you know, what is appropriate for children to encounter at certain ages versus others? I just listened to my son, who's 15 now, and I think he is so much smarter than me. And no, you know, but I mean, they they are so able to, they, they can see both sides of things. They, they're not jaded with all this stuff that big people get jaded with. We're not, they don't look at the world through this lens of, right, of, of, of uh, all the junk that big, big people put on it. Like, we're, we have to think about water saving the water but then we have to worry about you know the oil and then people's got money involved in that and then there's who cares they don't think about that stuff they just think about like why doesn't everybody have fresh water and everybody needs to and that's really how the whole world should think and i think too there's this tendency to project our own baggage or like as as carol said you know the lenses that we see the world through like we're all carrying a lifetime of garbage behind us and children aren't. But this idea that kids are too young to, you know, understand two men who love each other. And yet, and yet there's so many parents who are like, oh, have you met Johnny's little girlfriend? Oh, Johnny's little girlfriend. And they're like four. That's and you're right. Like, so they're young. They're, they're old enough to, you know, navigate having a girlfriend at age four, but but totally, we can't talk totally, to them about totally, men kissing. Totally, you know? <laughs> totally. How do you think, Joe, when you are like thinking about what to purchase for the library and, and how to build, you know, a collection that will serve children as well as future teachers and things like that, like at least in the context of the curriculum resource library, how do you think about those different ages and audiences? What does that look like from your perspective? If it isn't about gatekeeping what are you conscious of? Now with the Curriculum Resource Center, it's a lot different than it was than, than my time as a as a middle school library. But you know, librarians, first and foremost, most of us work in libraries where we have a collection development policy, you know, that informs how we build a collection. And but I always pushed back against this idea that you serve only the community that you're in. So I was I was a middle school librarian in a very tawny suburb of Pittsburgh, like uber wealthy and very, <laughs> and very conservative and very white. And um, so like conventional librarianship would be, would say like you collect for, you know, that population, you reflect the interests of that population. But in all populations, there are those who are overlooked or not seen. So even in this extremely wealthy suburb of Pittsburgh, there is a trailer park and our school served those children. So they're going to school with girls who have, you know, $3,000 Prada handbags. 
And so when I landed in that school library, like it was a very, very, very white conservative collection. And, you know, Pittsburgh is 10 miles and, you know, south of us. And there are issues that the students in this community need to know. So I made a very concerted effort to, you know, follow the collection development policy, but be like, there are no Coretta Scott King award-winning books in this collection, and that's a problem. There are no Portobello Prey books in this collection, and that's a problem. There are no books with queer characters or indigenous characters in this collection, and that's a problem. You know, like there is one Joseph Bruchak book, and it was Code Talkers, which is a great book, but like there are tons of other indigenous authors who are writing middle grade books that are appealing to a child audience, and I don't fault. The librarians who came before me who developed that collection but I think that it's a librarian's duty to think holistically and to realize that even if there is a majority in a community that majority doesn't speak for everybody and that there are other needs that have to be served so my my rule of thumb was always buy widely <laughs> and once you start building that kind of collection Kids start reading things that are outside the scope of their lives, that are outside the world that they have been insulated by, and they start asking for more of those mm -hmm. kinds of, of stories. Yep. How exciting that must be when they ask <sighs> for the more books, you know, I think. Wow. I, I felt like I really rolled the dice early <laughs> when I was in that uh, district and I bought this book called Totally Joe. It was not about me, uh, but, <laughs> but it's by James Howe, and it's uh, a book about a gay kid who writes this dictionary of his life. And so he has like A stands for da-da-da, and all 26 <laughs> chapters go through the letters of the alphabet. And Glee had just become big, and the first kid that I sold this book to, I was like, do you know Kurt and Glee? Joe is kind of, and she's like, I love mm -hmm. Kurt. And the book spread to all of her friends. They're like, do you have more books like oh. Totally Joe? And I was like, this is it. Yeah. This is how I you do it. Happened. I got you know? something going here. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. Discussion. If you are passionate about Big Ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Carol Lindstrom and Joe Prince about children's literature and activism. Carol, a notable aspect of Water Protectors is the way it directly addresses ecological and social harm caused by harmful practices, right, as you've talked about. How do you think writers should or could approach complicated issues like that in a way that remain approachable to youth, but without oversimplifying? How do you strike that balance? I guess, you know, kids, they they have all these things going on in themselves. And so I think that just keeping it really simple and sticking to, you know, things that they understand, but not talking down to them again, but for me, when I like, I like to write like with water protect. We are water protectors, um, where the story is a story, and then they have all the information at the back. The back matter is all the because I don't think personally. Like I think about my son when he read and children in general. Like they don't really want to be bogged down kind of with all this detail, and and that's not a story in a way. It's just like well and. 2016, you know, people were, you know, that's just too, too. Well, that's the didacticism, right? And yeah, that's sort of the old right. model of children's that's literature right. is that, like, you're going to tell them what to think, think. and mm -hmm. what to feel and what to do, that it's sort of like a conduct manual. Yes. Right? And so instead, talk this us tells them, this kind of lets them feel how they feel. You know, just when you're just talking, it, it just in big picture things like, you know, um, we come from water. We, you know, water is the first medicine, you know, our mothers, we were in water and, you know, just simple things like being in that just by that nature alone, I think that they see how sacred water is because, you know, when you tell them we come from water, you know, all everything needs water to live. Well, they know what that means, you know, so they can infer so much from that type of thing. Uh, so for me, I just like to be very, I don't know how to say it. I don't want to beat them on the head because I don't, that's not, but they don't need to be because they're smart enough to read between the lines. Carol, we've talked a bit about the problem with the lack of diversity in publishing and some of those changes, but you did win a Caldecott with Michaela Goad for We Are Water Protectors. You're with a major trade publisher, right? There are some shifts there. 
What do you hope kind of the next phase for the industry will be? You know, what what's the next, you know, obviously we've talked about the context of some of the backlash, but looking forward, now that you've got some of this success, what do you want to do next with your platform in terms of representation in children's literature? Well, um, one thing that is very important to me is to help bring up Indigenous illustrators. Because typically artists that are indigenous were never trained, you know, in graphic design or and so forth because there was never a need. No one ever wanted us to do books, you know. I mean, so when I have a, a book and we find – I always want to make sure this on my contract that I work with an indigenous author or illustrator and – that a lot of times, well, for a couple of my books, My Powerful Hair and um, The Gift of the Great Buffalo, both of the, il- uh, the illustrators on the books are artists first before they were illustrators so kindly that uh, the publishers are working to help the artists to, you know, to, to, to help kind of handhold them through the process because they're not used to the children, you know, publishing. It's just in, in graphic, does that type of thing. It's just not... And I've been grateful that the publishers that I've been working with are very open to that. I also think that um, one thing that needs to happen is there needs to be more indigenous people of color in um, actually the publishing houses in the big five, you know, because they're not enough, you know, especially I don't not very, very few indigenous people, if any that I know of. And that has a lot to do with the gatekeeping and, and what gets taken in and, so I think that we need to see more people in publishing that are indigenous and people of color and LBGQ plus, although that stuff is happening. But we just need to push it, especially with the indigenous population, I think, more, because I know that's where I really struggled was trying to <laughs> have people understand that these stories aren't just for indigenous people. They're stories for all of us. So, yeah. And, and it's not like there's a lack of Indigenous illustrators. I mean, Shanto Begay, S.D. Nelson, Julie Flett, they're all out there. Yes. They And they won major awards, too. So if, if we can get a handful, we can multiply that handful by even more. And if there's Indigenous representation, as if there's all representation within all the five major publishing houses, then, you know, we can bring more people to the table to invite those voices yes. into... The children's literature world. We've talked about the controversy. We've talked about kind of, you know, the pipeline challenges and how those are opening up. I'd love for each of you to talk about what role you think the public can play in ensuring more diverse representation. And what would you like listeners to do to help kind of improve the climate for diverse creators and diverse collections and things like that? Well, I think you could contact your library. I know that in the library, things they often have places to suggest books the library could um, carry. So I think making suggestions to your libraries um, to carry more diverse voices of books. And I think just that right alone for me to think of something that people could do right now. And also, of course, at home, parents could fill their libraries at home with diverse books. As your children see that the world is made up of many different patterns and colors and whatevers. And so, yeah, I think that stuff is important to uh, build your own library of it and then to talk to your own you know, li- public libraries and see about increasing their collections. Yeah. And I would also encourage people to read beyond themselves. Pick up a book that you have. If it's a scary thought, you know, like if you only like mystery books, I'm thinking of my husband who reads almost cozy (laughs) mysteries exclusively, you know, pick a book that's maybe a different genre and try something new instead of getting stuck in a rut. Try reading about experiences that are far beyond your own. And you'll realize very, very quickly that Literature really is for everybody there and and that if you push against what you how you conceive the world and how you and and how maybe you frame your experiences within the world, if you push against that and and you try different forms of literature, you'll be surprised. And if there's books that you don't see in your library, librarians love to advocate for people. Oh, yes, (laughs) definitely. And and, um, I think a lot of libraries are working really hard to 
make sure that those voices are amplified. Well, I can't think of a better way to end than with the endorsement of go to your local library, make use of it, tell them the books you want to see if you're not seeing what you want. Because that, yeah, there are barriers to creating your own library, right, financially for some, but your local library is a kind of magical place to explore the world. So go this to the library. This message has been brought to you by the American Library Association. <laughs> we love the library. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me today, Carol and Joe. Listeners, you can keep up with ICS happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSPGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information, visit bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Our producers for this podcast are Chris Cavera and Marco Mendoza with sound engineering by Deanna McKeegan and Marco Mendoza. Research assistance for this episode was provided by Branson Young with editing by Carrie Hanlon.